My topic is what I call the religious hysteric. In a previous clip, I hypothesized that maybe people who believe in a God who is a person lead more restrictive sex lives than other people because they worry that God is watching them. And they feel that, well, we can do this because God wants us to have children, but we better not do that and that because maybe God is watching. And I think that religion and sex sometimes don't go together well. I have a concept here I'd like to introduce. This is from engineering and physics. The idea of a stable and an unstable equilibrium. So this ball is in a stable equilibrium. You shake the bowl, let's say, the ball will move, but it'll eventually come right back to where it was. This ball is in an unstable equilibrium. If it begins to move to one side or the other, it's going to continue rolling till it's either in this valley or this valley. Now, in terms of uh, sexuality, we could consider this the middle way, the sane way. And on one side, uh, you read about it in the newspaper, you have people that uh, abuse children or um, take women captive or whatever. But I want to talk about the other side, about people who have a very restrictive, almost insanely restrictive attitude, in my opinion, towards sexuality. And I call these people religious hysterics because that attitude is often either motivated by religion or maybe they have that re attitude and they uh, use religion as a justification. That's kind of a chicken or an egg problem. Uh, let me begin. In my own life, in, um, I went to Catholic school, uh, grade school to eighth grade, and then high school. Now, in grade school, there were girls, but they were usually they were kept separate. In other words, they were on one side of the room or the other, or sometimes the boys were in front and the girls were in back. Probably because the boys were more troublesome. Not of, it, not of any uh, sexism, I guess. I went to high school. It was an old boys' high school. So when I was about 15, uh, women were terra incognito to me. I hadn't had my formal sex education. had consisted of a half hour. Uh, when we were freshmen, the principal of the high school came into our room and spent a half hour telling us something that probably all of us already knew. And that was it. So, there, and my parents uh, didn't talk about it, and people in the street seemed to have not reliable information. But there was a source that I thought had reliable information, and when I was about 15, I bought my first issue of this magazine here. And uh, unbeknown to me, in addition to what I expected to find, the editor, uh, Hugh Hefner, was writing a series called The Playboy Philosophy. And I read chapter 17 of that, and it made a big impression on me. And I believe it was in this issue. I'm not certain. The issue uh, cover looks familiar, but the philosophy I went back and got online. You can download the entire thing. It seems like it's available. And it didn't take long to find the chapter that had impressed me so much. And what we're going to see is someone who I believe has a uh, extremely warped attitude to its sexuality, and it goes seems to go hand in hand with this person's religion. So here's what I read. The book, well, here's the editor of the magazine, uh, Playboy magazine speaking, and he was sent a book called Plain Facts for Old and Young. And it was written 1879, and it was allegedly a guide to sane sex life as viewed in the United States in that period of extreme Puritanism. We'll see that uh, the word here, sane, is probably ironic. Okay, so let's jump in. The book was written by a, a, a Dr. Kellogg, physician, and here's what he had to say about certain things. First of all, puberty. He wanted, he thought it was a good idea to postpone it as long as possible. He wrote that females in whom puberty occurs at the age of 10 or 12, by the time that age is doubled, by the time they're 20 or 24, they're shriveled and wrinkled with age. Who knew? By the way, I'm going to go quickly. If you want to read the whole slide, 
just pause and you can even download the whole chapter or the whole entire Playboy philosophy if you're interested. Now, what about a man who passes a good looking woman on the street and has some unchaste thoughts? Mental unchastity. Well, if a man can't pass a good looking woman without having unchaste thoughts, he's basically a debauchee, a libertine. Because these filthy imaginings are seen by God, and God notes them. And these leave hideous scars on the soul. Uh, they, uh, and each of these thoughts are recorded, photographed in the books of heaven, where they appear in their innate hiddenness. And here, uh, the author, Dr. Kellogg, sings a little ode to purity. Okay. So, uh, I, my humble opinion, that this is not a balanced view, but there's more. Okay, lavicious daydreams, as we've just uh, kind of talked about, in a way, lead to, well, this is the least of it, it leads even to premature death without exercise of the genital organs. So just having daydreams can lead to premature death. Who knew? <sighs> this, okay, so one of the general causes of uh, sexual excitement in males is constipation. All right. Uh, um, continuing. Uh, oh, it's not so bad of females, says the good doctor. But I, I guess it's still not too good. All right. Man is the only animal that abuses his sex organs by uh, having sex when it's not possible to produce offspring, subservient to other ends than reproduction. He's the only sufferer of this foul disease, says the doctor. Now, in fact, the editor of the magazine says that that's not true, that non-procreative sex play of every sort is common in the higher forms of life, that it's only in the lower forms that uh, sexual desire coincides with ovulation in the female. Now, I happen to know that's true with dogs and cats, right? Uh, I believe uh, a female cat or a dog... Uh, only is interested in sex when they're ovulating. But human beings aren't cats and dogs. Something the good doctor apparently didn't realize. Marital excesses. You don't get a free pass just because you're married. Okay, a lot of people believe the marriage ceremony removes all restraint, but no. A man in whatever condition we find him is depraved and perverted. And man, meaning human beings, demonstrates his depravity whenever he engages in sex for anything but reproduction. That's the only time when sexual intercourse between a husband and a wife is proper, natural, and moral, according to the good doctor, Dr. Kellogg. And a child conceived and lost is certain to have an abnormally sexual nature. If the child doesn't become a rake or a prostitute, it will be either the result of uncommonly fortunate surroundings or a miracle of divine grace. A single immoral thought on the part of either parent at the critical moment when life is imparted, in other words, doing sexual intercourse, may forever, for all eternity, put a foul blot on the character of the soul, the baby yet formed. So, when husband and wife are having that rare sexual intercourse just for the purpose of having children, uh, they better not enjoy it too much or the child is going to be forever have a foul blot upon its soul. Birth control is as much a crime against nature as any sexual perversion. As a matter of fact, it's a form of abortion. So contraception is a, a big no-no. Now we come to his most last and most damning condemnation, masturbation. This is the longest chapter in the book. I highlighted this. This is an aside. Penential books? Probably pronouncing that wrong. In the medieval Catholic Church, uh, as you might know, Catholics go to confession and they're given penances. So... Um, you go to confession and 
Father, I lied to my parents. Say two, two Hail Marys. Well, these books were basically manuals for assigning penances so that the church was more or less uniform. They described various sexual, well, not only sexual, various sins and recommended penances that priests, I guess, followed or not. I don't know if they followed them, but that's what these books were. Okay. Now, the solitary vice is a big deal to the doctor who wrote the book, Dr. Kellogg, and he suggests that if you suspect your child of doing it, watch them carefully, and then when they appear to be asleep, throw off their bedclothes under some pretense, barge into their room and throw off their bedclothes and see if they are practicing that solitary vice, which will not do much to engender trust between child and parent, but I guess the solitary vice is serious enough that you have to do it. In fact, it's so serious that Dr. Kellogg suggests, if you find your child doing this, tying the hands, bandaging the parts, covering the organs with a cage, or circumcision without anesthetic. I'll stop here. You can read more. You can download the whole thing, as I said. But you might be thinking, well, why did I spend this time documenting the mind of some crank doctor over 100 years ago? I mean, there might be doctors today who believe in, uh, you know, aliens among us or whatever. I mean, but that doesn't mean anything. But this doctor was a highly respected, internationally renowned man of science. And uh, the editor of the magazine says that this doctor's views were representative of a significant portion of the population in the 1800s and early 1900s. Dr. Kellogg was a member of the Board of Health. He was a fellow of the American Association of Advancement of Science, American College of Surgeons, Royal Society of Medicine in England, etc., etc. When he passed away, he received tributes from Herbert Hoover, who had been president of the United States, John D. Rockefeller Jr., who was kind of like the Bill Gates of his day, and other notables. Plain Facts was listed in his obituary as one of his more important works, and Dr. Kellogg wrote texts that were used in public schools. Now, I think these, qualifi these qualifications show us that he wasn't entirely crazy. Uh, I think that maybe he was crazy only when it came to sexuality, and I think there's enough religious uh, references in his writing to associate his uh, craziness with religion. So the point I'm trying to make is I believe that there are some things that are very easy to find the right way. If, uh, if uh, fire burns, if you don't believe it, eventually you touch fire, you get burnt, and you come to the belief that fire burns. But other beliefs, the right way, I think, are not so easy to maintain. And it seems to me that belief uh, about sexuality uh, I think that the sensible way is somewhat in the middle, and it's easy to fall to one side or the other. The difference being that people who fall to this side, who uh, practice sadism, who abduct women, who, who uh, rape children, I was going to say aren't part of an organized religious community, but um, there's a notable exception, uh, a priest. But, People who fall to this side are often part of an organized religion, and there's often religions which promote these views. I don't know of any groups that promote views on this side of the spectrum, although I suppose there are. But uh, major religions have often promoted, uh, pro promoted views which seem to be over here, the very restrictive, very hypercritical view of sexuality. So that's what this is about. Thanks for listening.